In Chinese, there is a saying called silence and scold. Right. That is embracing the culture where we think before we speak. So silence is okay because we're thinking about what we're going to say. And I think that's quite different from perhaps the Western culture where, especially, I guess, maybe in some more American side of things, you tend to just speak what you think. And I think, you know, these things happen, right? So I think sometimes people go, oh, yeah, I'm not very good in English. I can't think on my feet. Well, take your time to think because that's okay. <laughs> I'm actually going to do something a bit slightly different here because I think it will provide a useful context into your journey as well. So I want to start with the why before we dive into the how. So like in this mm. season of your life, what is your objective and why is that your objective? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm going through a bit of career transition myself. Um, I have originally been in the corporate um, environment for the last 10 odd years and lately I've taken a turn and go into coaching. Um, I got trained up as a coach about two years ago since the pandemic has hit I've been really reflecting on what I wanted to do in my life um, and therefore I made that my aim and lately I've been coaching people who are from a multicultural background as I am. Um, so this is my aim at the moment I'm aspiring to coach more people who maybe from similar backgrounds or even different backgrounds to myself, who are perhaps struggling a little bit in their career journeys and also in their career journeys, perhaps to relocate to a new country as well. Um, and that is my aim at the moment. It's really interesting where the, the more I've mm. done these sessions and just from listening to podcasts in general, I start to get a sense of what really drives people to take something that they might find an interest to learn about to really mm. pursue it in something that they want to build an expertise around and then go and help others achieve the same level of learning or uh, learning from both sides that are happening at the same time, right? So it's ultimately taking a passion and turning it into a purpose. For your case, yeah. going back to the earliest context that you can provide, what, what do you think mm -hmm. set the scene for why you've taken you know, something that people may just find an interesting thing to know about into something that you've really turned into a goal and a purpose that you now hold. Yeah, so this is really interesting. So I could give a little bit of background of where I came from and actually how my family origins um, are from. So my paternal grandfather was actually from the Hubei province in China. Um, I've never visited the place, but he was from there and he's migrated from uh, Hubei to uh, Hong Kong since a very young age. Um, at, you know, during this time, he was really faced by a lot of wars. There was the Sino-Japanese War. There was the Chinese Civil War that really shook up the whole country. Um, he moved from Hubei to Hong Kong and various places in between um, and really kind of holds still to the belief that he would find something for himself in a new place. Um, and I think that was where I got really inspired of his life and actually how we are also in a new country at the moment as an immigrant. Um, I say new country, I've been here for the last 15 years or so. Um, but I think that some of the challenges that are faced by immigrants are still very pressing and I still face into them sometimes. And I feel that in my life, I've encountered a lot of people who are in this space as well. So having kind of learned how my granddad has originated from China and brought a lot of, um, I guess, this kind of bravery into mm -hmm. facing uncertainty into the family, I'm now being able to ca really carry that forwards to um, what I do um, and really kind of talk about um, how people could settle in better, how people could have more confidence in um, kind of doing things better, either in the workplace or facing into their own families as well. Yeah, there's there's something that you touched on there and mm. uh, it coins into exactly what we're going to dive into, which is this idea of cultural mm -hmm. intelligence. It's something that I've really been mm. exploring myself. Uh, and in a, a pre few previous episodes, I've kind of explained how to separate the concept of cultural intelligence, CQ, uh, as a measure versus something mm. like EQ. Because a common thing will be like, well, isn't understanding cultures similar to just understanding people? And that's EQ. And I think there is a, mm. it, I think it falls under the same thing. Uh, to have a high CQ, you do need a high EQ. But for me, cultural intelligence is really about increasing your pleasure but also drive 
to seek out people that are from different cultures and in a workplace context that would be do you have that drive to collaborate and again seek out colleagues that work across different cultures so yeah in your say early years given the the background mm-hmm. of uh, what you've just explained about where your sort of previous mm-hmm. generations have come from do you see how their mm-hmm. experience led to you either being exposed to people from other cultures at a young age or did you see in yourself where you kind of had that um almost interest or curiosity to connect with other cultures or did that tend to come a bit later in your journey yeah that's a really fascinating question because I was reflecting on this as I was preparing for the podcast as well and I think in my early days so actually I haven't explained why I've come to the UK so to give a little bit of context um I studied in Hong Kong until I was 15 and at the time there was a a lot of uh, there's a trend basically of people going over to other places to study so at the age of 15 I decided with my family to take this leap of faith and go to a boarding school um in the UK so I went on my own with a best friend thankfully um but then I went in without my family so my parents were still in Hong Kong as I did this journey abroad um there were lots of moments where I felt like gosh you know um although there are lots of different uh, people of different multicultural uh, backgrounds in the school I still feel that there is a sense of okay I need to really overcome this fear of talking to people in English I still need to really overcome my fears as I need to raise my hand to answer questions or even ask questions um I think there was just a lot of um kind of underlying maybe confidence issues as I was started my journey in the UK um I recall you know just being in an environment where I was thriving actually academically but still I was shaking as I raised my hands up every single lesson even in physics that I really thrived on um and I think there's a little bit of cultural context there because I think in the Asian culture we really value things like humility we value modesty and even a simple gesture as raising your hand up I'm feeling a really so a sense of nervousness in me as I do that um I think there's just a massive cultural different uh, a cultural difference as I went into this new, new country to study So back when I was 15 I came over you know I had to overcome all these fears and I think that really made me think about how I could communicate to different people um because I had this sense this resonance with them um especially from people who may not have come from a uh, sort of an English speaking country and not have English as as a first language and I really see similarities I think in conversations even in the workplace as I dived into work in London um that I seem to strike a chord better with people who are from a multicultural background because mm. I think the conversations just flow more easily because you could talk about things like oh what do you do for festivals what do you speak you know in 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 terms of different language you know what are the nuances how do you how do you learn um these different languages and um i just feel it just feels like much more easier if you if i'm in a multicultural context and i've got a diversity of people of people to talk to that's not to say i can't really communicate with people who are english speaking as first language it just means that i think there is a sense of okay you know if i compare the two there is a definitely a drive towards talking to people who are from a multicultural background with more ease just before touching on that so the mm. yeah, yeah there's a really interesting point there around the nervousness when it comes to things mm. like raising your hand right and a lot of that is kind of a self belief of how you'll be perceived especially when you're in an environment that you're new to right where maybe mm. it's not your first language or oh, do i even know how to communicate with these people that are from a different background to me but in do you see that as a common uh, sort of set of values that were instilled when you were younger either by the environment that you're raised in or your say schooling environment at a younger age mm. where there is this tendency from certain cultures of you know not answering back to people elder you know the the idea of there is quite a clear hierarchy so especially if you look at family backgrounds is kind of the older sibling is revered or the older member of the the upper generation is kind of seen as the head figure and yeah. e- even if you tend to disagree it's kind of you wouldn't i think it's a confucius teaching right you you never let them lose face i think there is a specific chinese term for it which i i don't know maybe you know it but it's you know you don't you don't talk back to elders even if you 
have a view of disagreement and definitely not in a group setting like you know around the dinner table or in a in a sort of work meeting because you would never want them to lose face and that's kind of going against the principles that uh again you know set by Confucius teachings did you see that in your early years as being quite a common understanding amongst the other the kids that you were surrounded by yeah, no, that's a really interesting one. Um, having grown up in Hong Kong and having studied in primary school and several years of secondary school, I could say that there's definitely a culture of really treasuring obedience and respect. And I think this is instilled from a very young age. Um, so people in Hong Kong and even in, I think, wider Asian cultures would really treasure that as uh, kind of, as you said, the Confucians uh, sort of um, teaching to say that you need to really respect people who are older than you and also people in authority. Mm. So I think in a school setting, you would immediately um, be faced by rules and also um, cultures and uh, rituals mm. um, that you would need to um, go into every single day. So for example, you would need to greet your teacher. And the first thing that you need to do is to stand up. So someone would actually call out, stand up. Wow. And then you all stand up as a class and then you bow. <laughs> and I was always say good morning Mrs X and then basically you sit back down um bowing is probably not uh <laughs> probably mandatory actually you're thinking about it now um but you would always stand up and call out the teacher's name and then sit back down um so that's kind of the just you know it gives you a little bit of sense of how respect is formed from a very young age and you'll do that throughout the years of primary school and even into secondary school in some cases um so I think yes that is a value that has been built in in me um, and I carried that across to when I studied in the UK too. Um, that's not a bad thing, you know, innately, you know how to respect people better. You know how to, you know, um, sort of obey to rules a bit better. You won't be the troublemaker at school. The, back, uh, the drawback from that is that you probably won't question as much as other kids perhaps in the Western world about certain things. And you will, because we always are expected to follow authority, um, things are kind of maybe imposed on you and you may never question why that is. And that's certainly the case for me. Um, I've grown in a household where I was kind of the goody child. <laughs> so I would always respect my parents. I would always respect the teachers. I would be academically very sound. Um, I would actually grow up, you know, even um, at school, I won't make any trouble. I was always a good kid. Um, and that would be the same for me even here. Um, but I think that had me thinking about, well, actually, you know, what happens to things like confidence? Mm -hmm because we don't question and we um, sometimes are not as curious perhaps as other kids. And sometimes um, it really, when, you know, when you're facing to things that are unknown to you, you lose a little bit of curiosity or the, you know, the right questions to ask in scenarios as such. So I think there are drawbacks of this virtual. Um, I won't say it's a bad thing after all, um, but it would basically make me rethink about some of the values, especially as I go into the Western world and it you know my values will be challenged a little bit even to this day yeah and you said that you took that leap of faith when you moved to the uk was that something that mm. was you know did you sense there was a kind of calling what made you take that leap to think i want to mm. firstly that i want to explore new bounds and, and new new yeah. borders uh, you know what really fired that curiosity but then second how did you actually deal with taking that step because i imagine some people listening mm. will say, share that sentiment that this is something they've wanted to yeah. do but it's a whole different conversation when it comes to actually thinking okay now i'm going to do this yeah i guess one thing i'd say that at teenager is such a tender age and looking back i felt like you know at the time perhaps i was thinking oh i'm old enough to make decisions but thinking back, that was still a very, very young age. A lot of my beliefs were still developing. Um, I'd say that at the time when I made this decision, it was, you know, with my parents, but it wasn't their wishes, so to speak. So I think a lot of people think that, oh, your parents might have put you through this trouble. Um, but actually, I decided that for myself. So I'm really thankful for my parents for letting me have this freedom to really think for myself. I think at the time, what drove me to decide on this was the drive to have more um of a sense of adventure. Mm. Um, I was looking for adventure. I was looking for places where I could expand my knowledge. I was looking for maybe a little bit of independence as well. I'm <laughs> going from quite a traditional um, Chinese family. Um, and I think that sense of adventure, maybe from my grandparents as well, you know, um, really kind of drove me into thinking about, okay, what if I could study abroad right now? 
and really I'm really grateful for my parents support on that at the time um, my, my father was working in the civil service and there were lots of bursaries for people who are in that realm to go over to the UK to study um, so I was really thankful for that and I was thinking okay, well you know what if I don't like it at the end I could always turn back but um, I guess you know 20 odd years down the line I'm still here so <laughs> I mean I guess what I didn't realize was how big an impact that had at the time so of course I've decided to go to the UK. Um, I've also decided to come back every holiday when I can to visit my family. But I would never have thought at that point to have stayed in the UK. And I think that's the impact of a decision. And I think we bump into that so much in our lives. We don't realize at the time that certain decisions in our lives would have such an impact. Um, probably same with your parents, Anna, and as they come over to the UK, you know, they wouldn't probably have known, you know, how big an impact that might have on future generations too. So I'm facing into, you know, these sort of questions and dilemmas perhaps in a daily basis, um, thinking, you know, oh, what if one day I needed to back, be back in Hong Kong, what would happen? And actually what would happen to my kids right now who are, you know, obviously legitimately sort of third culture kids um, growing in an environment where most people don't actually look like them. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'm just, I'm just finding it really intriguing, to be honest. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. And I think I never regretted the decision when I was 15 to come over to the UK to study. I still expanded my horizons. I'm really grateful for the um, education that I received here um, and that I'm now really able to speak fluently in another language as well. Um, and by being bilingual and being able to teach my kids Chinese as well. Um, so, yeah, I never regretted the decision, but I think it just made me reflect on how big that decision was at the time. Yeah, I really like um, what you've, the way you've kind of positioned that because I've actually only probably a week ago finished the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Mm, and, yeah, you know, if, yeah, yeah. if people haven't read it, it's, it's such an interesting read because what it's touching on, which I probably didn't realize when I first started the book, was just how important it is to grasp the concept that things like success are not just driven by the decisions that you make and the intelligence that you build up but quite a big proportion of that is the opportunities and inheritances that have been created for you from moments mm -hmm. that are either in your background culture or the things that happened before your time uh, sometimes down to just the point in history that your parents or grandparents were born in that awarded them such opportunities along with the decision for you to take that opportunity that you've been given so I think it's twofold it's you know appreciating that it could even be a three or four year difference in age where um, if your grandparents had been born four years earlier for example where the economy was slightly different or a certain reform hadn't been passed that gave uh, you know an opportunity where there was international scope, for example, then you wouldn't have had the opportunity to then take what you did. But the fact that, you know, mm. in the in the backstory that you've already described, and then the fact that you said that you've appreciated what doors probably got opened for you and the encouragement that you got from your parents and then deciding to do it, this kind of a multi-layered probably reason and appreciation to know that a lot of things had to fall in place for you to do it. And then you decided to take it. And now yeah. it's it's just going to have a, a bigger knock-on effect to, like you say, talking about your kids and, and what opportunities get granted to them. Then it becomes up to them to decide whether they take it. So, yeah, really, really insightful to get that perspective on, you know, like you said, even in my parents' and grandparents' case, they may not have, They, I mean, certainly they didn't consciously know that because they hadn't read outliers because mm. it definitely wasn't made then uh, <laughs> consciously know that they were doing that but in them yeah. having taken certain decisions some of it against their own choice like in in my parents mm. case being forced to leave east africa but mm. being at the age that they were and this moment happening in the early 70s they were positioned enough to be able to go to the UK instead of having to go back to India. And then that then awarded me the opportunities that I do. So, you know, grouping that all together, I think there's so much that people can gain from just understanding some of these stories that came before them. 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think you've put it so beautifully Um, because I was also reflecting on, again, my paternal grandfather's um, trip basically from China. And yes, so much of it happened almost by chance, right? Um, He didn't choose in a way to have the war, obviously. Well, you know, he didn't choose to have the war, um, but he probably chose the opportunity or, you know, kind of took the opportunity to be in a certain place at a certain time. So he was in this place called... um, uh, 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 I think it's Shao Guan, uh, when he um, wanted to basically move down um, and he got chosen um, as well as part of an education scheme, you know, out of 250, uh, uh, actually uh, as part of the 250 people to move to Hong Kong during this Chinese civil war. So, um, you know, there were a lot of things that happened by chance for him. And I think he was privileged to be able to be chosen. Um, I think at the same time, there were conscious choices as well. The, the choice to perhaps stay in Hong Kong to work, maybe semi-forced, but you know there was choices in between that, um, choices to have a family. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have been born. <laughs> so I think there were a lot of um, conscious choices along the way that kind of multiplied to then for me to have this life that I have right now. Um, so yes, I guess in my generation, my parents chose to go to work and really sustain the family using their financial income. Um, so there was a lot of choices in between that we sometimes take for granted. Um, and I think the way we view success differs generation to generation as well. I think in my grandfather's generation, obviously there was a lot of war going on, you know, um, they didn't have as much as choice and much of an option to learn things that they may want to learn. But even then, uh, my grandfather chose to learn English, um, in his spare time. And that's how he actually got into some roles as a clerk into large corporates and sustain his family that way. Um, my maternal side of grandparents also chose to work in um, environments. Um, my my um, grandfather worked on boats and ships and had a lot of work done there. Uh, whilst my maternal grandmother worked at home whilst taking care of a lot of kids. You know, there were some choices there, but you know, that was the norm at the time, I think for a lot of them as well. Um, And down to my parents' generation, because of their hard work, they were able then to perhaps go to university to earn an income in an office space, which was very, very different from what their parents would have done, perhaps. So um, I think, yes, I think how I've got here, I'm really appreciative of all the hard work that my previous generations have put in. Um, And I think I shouldn't really take that for granted. Um, even in this privileged position that I am in right now. Yeah, I love that. And just going on to your memories of first arriving to the UK, do you remember what the biggest culture shock was for you? Yeah. Hmm. I think I need to think about that. Perhaps it, this is to do with being in a boarding school as well, perhaps. <laughs> so I was in a girls' school um, and we have to use English all the time. And I think the biggest cultural shock is how I was then landed immediately into a multicultural environment without realizing, um, and I couldn't use my own language. Um, so there were even instances where school staff would say, can you use English, even if where we're speaking to people who are of the same kind or same origin? Um, and I think that was a little bit of a shock because our language is so, it's such a gift, right? Mm. And I think, having be, ha, be being able to use it means that we could embrace a little bit about our home and i think the way it was maybe not dismissed but kind of discouraged was a little bit um scary for me in a way so i think there was obviously a really good reason behind it because if say two people speak in cantonese or mandarin or whatever language you use the others may not be able to understand it and what if you're speaking about others right but at the same time i feel that that was a little bit I think hostile is a strong word, but I feel a little bit that way. Well, a lot of people have left their home countries to come study and it was a big, big shift for them. So I almost wish that I could kind of had to, you know, I, I was almost wish that I spoken up about that or, you know, kind of talk to teachers about it or talk to maybe, you know, people who feel similarly about it to find out how they felt. Um, so that was one, I think. The other one, I think, is coming back to that learning method. I think we learned by obedience Mm -hmm. in a way. So we were spoon fed a lot of knowledge. Um, We read and we recite, and that's how we learned our language and other things associated um, to to our culture as well. You know, it was very, 
precise. The Chinese language is very precise. And also it's very different um, from learning English where in English you would learn by phonics and you, it's more kind of audio. Um, so it's more based on how you hear than you kind of then work out how you say things. For the Chinese language, you learn by visual styles. So you look at the character and you recognize how it's written and you remember how it's spoken. So I think that has also a bearing on how I've learned my stuff. So I basically you know, rely on my memory a lot. Um, and sometimes I don't really rely on understanding um, fully. Um, and I think whilst that's got me through school, in university, I struggled. Um, and also, I think there was a lot of me that I, I can't say that, you know, this is the sole reason why I've learned this way. You know, obviously, a lot of people in Hong Kong still strike for understanding the context. Um, but I think this is one element that had contributed, perhaps, in my style of learning. Um, so I'd say that, you know, I think the Western style is more, you know, the, the kind of, um, I, I would say the teachers kind of encourage us more questions and sparks curiosity that way. Whereas I think the Hong Kong way, um, I think we are trying to do more of that, but I think there was still a lot of spoon feeding in my time. So I think there was definitely a conflict in terms of how I've learned in Hong Kong versus how I would have learned in the UK. It's not to say one way is better than the other. It's just, you know, there's that sort of cultural context in there as well. You talking about that has just reminded me of something really interesting that I um, came to learn about. So I spent two years in China myself so in mm. um in my late 20s so I was you know my kind of my personality and characteristics had formed and and a lot of my habits as well but the you know there's the common stereotype of how Chinese people are just really good at maths right oh it's the, they're just born being really good <laughs> at maths and it's yeah. it's just something that's very um light-heartedly stereotyped about them but then mm. I remember reading um just why that is such a prominent stereotype that's formed because it does hold true that um, especially East Asians uh, they tend to perform a lot better when it comes to math so where has that come from and you know a lot of it's yeah. well the the level of sort of pressure that's put on the kids to study really hard sure that plays a bit of a role but then many cultures share that same um, upbringing and what it what, what one of the the major contributing factors was I wish I remember the number, but there's there's a certain amount of numbers that um, we as humans can memorize quickly. And it's based on how much we can pick up in a certain number of seconds. I believe it's three seconds. It could be mm. it could be way less. So if anyone knows it, then, okay. then um, be great to to find out or. Um, I, I'll find the article and I'll put it in the, the podcast description. Yeah, that'd be great. But yeah. say, saying it's, let's say it's three seconds. The um, mm -hmm. the way the sort of uh, English or Latin like numbering system works, right? You have one, two, three, four, and then you have something like seven. So seven is two syllables. And then when you get into the double digits, sure, you have things like 14, but then the, you have irregular ones like 11, 12, right? They're, it's not yeah. one teen, it's not two teen. But when you then look at the Chinese numbering system, and that's why I mentioned that I live there, because then I started learning how that worked. So it's, they're all one syllable. And then and there's a big, mm. there's a bigger logic when it comes to moving past 10. And then when it comes to moving into the, the other, so say ba eight, basha yeah. is 80, um, jo is nine, mm -hmm. then you just basha yeah, jo, yeah. which means 89, right? Liu shi san. Yeah. So yeah. there's, there's much more of an easier logic to pick up, which I think yeah. it's something like a year five English um, student in maths uh, will be comparable yeah. to a year three Chinese student because the, 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 the number of the number of numbers, so the amount of numbers that that a Chinese student can say in Chinese in three seconds, you can fit a lot more numbers in. So the ability to memorize a larger number of numbers in that, mm. that window that our brain can process is, um, yeah. there's a lot more numbers that can be fit in. So yeah. it makes memorization and also calculation when it comes to, well, because there's a fixed pattern that follows in zero all the way up to 99 and probably beyond, that uh, it just becomes yeah. easier to process calculations. So again, it's really fascinating where 
it kind of ties in, I don't know if you'd call it culture, but just in the system of mm. the way that the language is built, it is a lot more yeah. conducive to um, people who have grown up with the Chinese numbering system are able to learn maths. So there's there's a bigger yeah. reason apart from just being able to say like, well, they're just born being good at something. There's a logic to it. <laughs> it's really fascinating to learn that. Yeah, I think that's really cool. Um, yes, we were just talking about this actually at the weekend um, when someone came to visit. So some of our friends came to visit and one of them was British. The others were from Hong Kong. And we were just musing on the fact that we memorized um, multiplication tables mm. so easily because basically you would have the song. It's almost like a rhyme and it would just go very punchily. And I've got like a recording of it if you're ever <laughs> interested in, in kind of listening to it. Um, but it's so rhythmic. And, you know, as you say, the numbers were single syllabled. So it was very, very punchy. And I think that's why my son at, you know, three years old has memorized some of this. <laughs> I think it's just so easy to pick up. And I think everyone, you know, kind of speaks, you know, in a very logical way because um, the language is shaped that, yeah, when, when it comes to 10, then you go to kind of 10, one, 10, two, basically. So it's really easy to remember. Whereas I think in an English language, you've got slightly different things like, yeah, 11, 12 that come in and then 20, you know, can kind of spelt in a strange way. And you almost think like, okay, so how do I need to kind of voice this? And it's not intuitive at all. Whereas the Chinese language is much more intuitive. So I think there is definitely, I think it, it might be in the outliers actually that I've read. Oh, that, it could be actually, yes, yeah. that's probably why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's why um, I think in the Chinese culture, you know, people seem to thrive with maths, maths and that's one of the contributors to it. Yeah, it's fascinating. And so the, the years that followed of being in the UK, um mm, yeah was did you go straight into being interested in this space of uh you know interculturalism or what was the the sort of next phase after for like the first years of schooling yeah yeah so i think um my <laughs> so i've took i've taken the very um you could say like a very asian route of thinking when i graduated from university um i actually graduated with a chemistry or natural science degree um, and when I, when I did that, I was thinking, OK, so what is the natural next step for me? Perhaps to be in the job that gains me the most income. That's how I think traditionally how Asian people think. Um, and I think that's partly because we see our parents working so hard for their families, too. And obviously we want to be in a place where we could be affluent enough for our future families and maybe, you know, just for ourselves, to be honest. Um, so I was in that space thinking, OK, what can I go into as a career? And I think the most popular options were going into banking or finance, consulting, and also maybe one of the big fours in audit. And those were kind of norms for us. Um, everyone that I knew in the sort of Hong Kong society were pursuing those routes or maybe being in academia, which I knew wasn't really quite for me. So when I graduated, I was thinking, OK, I'm going to apply for these jobs. Um, and thankfully, because I did an intern at EY, I got into a graduate job at EY straight after. Um, and I was very thankful for that. You know, it was a very cool environment to be working in. I could learn so much about different uh, different um, industries and also different cultures as well, um, because it was just su such a diverse environment. Um, but it wasn't until later on that I realized that this was a little bit of, um, you know, I, I was kind of not feeling very fulfilled in my job. So after six years, I've got to the manager grade. I've learned a lot. I've um, managed people. I've got to a place where I've been traveling quite a lot as well. And slowly that novelty started to wear off. And I was really thinking about, OK, so what do I really want to do in my future? So the search kind of started then. I wanted so much of this purpose in my life that wasn't really reflected in perhaps how I see my job. And I wanted to do something different. Um, and that was when I actually found a coach in the company. And they were very, very nice. They actually have this benefit for employees who are in a company to just speak to a coach directly. Um, and I was really enlightened through that experience. I realized what my values were. I realized what was important and what was priority for me at the time. So I decided to take a bit of a break, which was, again, countercultural, because coming from an Asian family, I think a lot of people think you need to work, work, work and work hard um, to really feed your family, to be in a place where you are affluent enough, then you could retire or, you know, think about retiring. Um, that wasn't the case for me. I didn't want to work um, because I, I didn't want to work to a point where I kind of go into burnout and not really know what my purpose is. So I took a step out and I decided to really think of, you know, what is it that I want to be building for my future? And I realized that coaching itself is such an empowering thing to do. 
And I really love to speak to people who have had maybe a similar background to me, or maybe from a different sort of multicultural background, who could really embrace a cultural identity in their work and also work towards a better career for themselves, a better path that may not be the traditional path for them. Yeah, you spoke about those years that you spent at Ernst Young, which is obviously a huge, mm. huge global organization. So you're thrown into an environment where you are working across different teams of different cultures, but also probably your client yeah. base also comes from back, uh, all kinds of different backgrounds. You know, in terms of your own development within that role, how did you find that adjustment from going from, um, yeah, um, probably a, a slightly multicultural boarding school and and a university, but when you're really thrown into an environment where it's now a multicultural workplace where there's probably mm -hmm. more of a expectation or requirement to have to collaborate and communicate, right? Because it's it almost your job, yeah, well, you know, your livelihood depends on it now. Um, how was that? Yeah. How was that step? Yeah, great question. I think this made me reflect on the earlier question about how I found perhaps being in environments where there are more multicultural people versus maybe like a more local culture. And I think this is maybe at work, this was the first time where I needed to step out of my comfort zone. Because in schooling, I could always kind of really be with my own crowd, speaking Cantonese with my <laughs> crowd from Hong Kong. But here is where you need to work with others and you need to be working multiculturally. And I found that challenging, to be honest. Um, I think there are instances where I tried very hard to fit in and I didn't know what to say, perhaps in social situations. And even in work, I find that, you know, people may have very slightly different work, work ethics. And I think we see some of the challenges differently as well. So I think it was challenging in a sense that I needed to be thrown into the deep end and kind of be expected to kind of how to communicate. Um, but I think I've learned my way through that. Um, I started to come off my shell a little bit more. Um, I applied to, for example, the advisory shadow board where I was speaking to multiple, uh, multi, sorry, very diverse people as part of a shadow board that helps the leadership to make decisions. Um, I started to work in other aspects within, um, so not just project work, but also internal work to do with communications. So I deliberately throw myself out there where I thought I wasn't good enough. Um, and I think that really helped. I think that helped me build up my confidence, perhaps my sense of presence, and also how I better communicate with people who are from maybe not a similar background to myself in that sort of multicultural, multinational um, corporate environment. You have so many resources and you could reach out so easily to different people to talk about your strengths and weaknesses as well. And I remember being also in the EY Far East Network um, where I could also talk about some of my internal struggles with people who are just like me. So I think it's embracing the differences, but also kind of building trust with people who you, you know you work with um, and really being able to be vulnerable at times with people that you trust. Yeah, there's, you know, I was kind of reflecting or thinking about having spent seven years working in the UK where I grew up or specifically in London. And so I probably didn't have those same set of challenges but then later in my career so going towards my late 20s that's when I decided to move to China and I was based in Shanghai I started off an international company so again I didn't necessarily feel that um, cultural let's say like hurdle of having to merge with or um, integrate with um, a, a different set of people would like you say maybe different ethics or behaviors but when I then moved to a local startup where the majority of the workers were local Chinese people, um, even though the, the mm -hmm. management board was slightly higher, that's when I noticed a slight change in how my approach was when I was at work. And, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's commonly, I'd say these like two layers of anxiety when it comes to building intercultural relationships, which I, which I really noticed. One is that cultural intelligence or CQ um, piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. which is, do I have an understanding of how different uh, people from different cultures then behave or react or have certain inbuilt 
ways that they approach situations right and that all and it's it's a component along with their personality every person is different but it's an understanding of okay actually maybe the way that they behaved wasn't because they were inefficient or disrespectful but it could be linked to Mm. their cultural um, background so when you have that perception it becomes easier to overcome that initial hurdle of okay this person is different to me will they like me will they understand each other Um, once you form that cultural intelligence then you again like I mentioned earlier you have more of that initiative or incentive to seek out speaking to people from different cultures which really helps in the workplace the second thing and you touched on it earlier is language competence so yeah there's having a cultural intelligence and then there's having the competence in the language that is in the surroundings that you're around that will really determine whether you have the confidence to approach different cultures and it really applies in the sense of those impromptu or informal conversations that come about right so you know when you're in the workplace Mm. um, how likely are you to just go up to someone at their desk and start uh, an impromptu conversation that's not bounded by, okay, we have a a work meeting at 2 p.m. that I need to be involved in. And a lot happens in those moments, right? Because that's when you can sort of build that quality personal relationship with people. That's when you have the opportunity to sort of clarify any misunderstandings, either on a personal Mm. or professional level. Um, And you you even find you know, if you've experienced it, you may even end up exchanging information about the tasks that you're working on that wouldn't be brought out in a in a formal meeting because that's when you can talk about it on a much more personal level. And so over time, that can really affect your performance, right? Because say if there is mm. a project that doesn't get delivered as expected or something is misunderstood, if you've built that connection with someone, then you can you're you're less anxious or worried to go and approach that person to say hey i didn't understand it or hey this didn't go to plan and then that can have that impact so yeah that overcoming that anxiety of that cultural competence and then also um that language competence is is yeah is huge so you know what would your advice be to someone who may be faced with this kind of situation and kind of similar to what you experience where they may not necessarily have that well-supported organization that can provide them the mm. means to be able to do it how do they then overcome these anxiety hand- hurdles in a intercultural relationship setting yeah yeah I think you've raised a very great point just now and I just want to feedback on that because I've definitely resonated with the sort of language competency point um, I know I've been here a long time, but still I struggle with that sometimes to really articulate myself because I'm bilingual and sometimes my brain switches from one to the other. And I think my advice to people who may also struggle with that is that to know that you're enough and your language isn't everything. So a language, your language is how you express yourself. And ultimately, if you've got other ways to express yourself, then do that. Um, there's always room for you to express yourself and don't let language to become your barrier. Um, I say that a lot of times when it comes to work, obviously we want to be speaking in a fluent sort of manner so that others can understand as well. But there is also, you know, that sense of perception as well. So actually how you perceive yourself is very different to others perceive you. And most of the time, I say maybe nine out of 10 times, you think you haven't spoken very well, but actually others were fine. They saw your body communication. They saw how your demeanor was and they know what you mean. And if it's, you know, not, you know, if they're not sure, they will ask. And also you could always explain again to make it clearer to them. So don't let that become your barrier and you could always over communicate your point. I love that. I love exactly what you've said there because um, it, it, have you heard of something called the liking gap? Ah, uh, no, (laughs) I think it rings a bell, but I'm not 100%. It's, it's, uh, It's really following along the lines of exactly what you've just said. It's this it's this concept mm. when it comes to social interactions that we tend to assume awkward conversations are on the whole more our fault than the others when it comes to new people, mm. right? Because as humans, it's always intimidating speaking to someone you haven't spoken to before or you haven't built that relationship with, right? And it's it's the contrast to that understanding of, um, you know, the, uh, the classic statistic of, 
um, over 70% of people think they are above average, uh, above average skill set at driving, right? And so the number is very skewed because Mm -hmm. we we tend to overestimate our skill sets in certain areas. But for some reason, when it comes to social interactions, it almost flips on its head. And it's exactly what you say, right? So regardless of a cultural context, but I think it applies even more there. Um, when we're having this interaction with someone and say we make a faux pas or a slip up of some sort, we amplify that error so much more in our head than the other person has done so. You, you can see it in you know job interviews, you're going for a job interview and you're like, I can't believe I said that. And then you end up getting the job yeah. and you're like, oh, phew, I got away with that. Because uh, uh, in interviews, they're paying a bit more attention. But on the whole, when it comes to an interaction that you have with someone, the main things that they are picking up on is, do I trust this person? Did they resonate a good energy? Um, do I feel like I can get, al- get along with them, right? Whereas w- what's very unlikely, unless it's been insulting, is that every individual thing that you said is going to be remembered, whereas you remember that negative moment so much more. So I think yeah. the point that you made about perception is so key that especially when it comes to cultural context, we might go into something and be like, oh my God, I'm sp- uh, I spoke, I said something in their language and I, it was, you know, I know I messed that up completely. I used the wrong word. It might even have had like a funny, you know, there's so many of these examples of in one language, it means something. Another language, when you say it, it, it could, it, it comes across as yeah. very um, almost like self-detrimental or funny in some yeah. way. And then they might laugh at it. Mm. Um, but yeah, we, tend to perceive that that comes across as us being seen as less than we are without capturing Mm. the context of well actually on the whole that trust and that relationship grew because we connected and I came across with that that positive energy that they've then taken away that it was a good interaction Mm. so yeah I think it's really worth stressing that point that the perception that we have of ourselves is a huge driver of that level of confidence that we have where the other person probably isn't perceiving what we think they what we think they think we are yeah that is so true yeah yeah and it just made me think of also how we handle things like silences Mm. um i think that's also a cultural thing because in chinese there is a saying called silence and scold right um and i think you know that is embracing the culture where we think before we speak so silence is okay because we're thinking about what we're going to say. And I think that's quite different from perhaps the Western culture, where especially, I guess, maybe in some more American side of things, you tend to just speak what you think. Um, And I think, you know, these things happen, right? So I think sometimes people go, oh, yeah, I'm not very good in English. I can't think on my feet. Well, take your time to think, because that's okay. (laughs) It's a good point, actually. That's that's probably a good one for me to know, because there's, you know, there's a... Mm not to always use Americans as an example there. Americans have such extremes to their culture, it becomes easy to use them as an example, but they're not the only ones. But, mm. you know, the the idea sure. of speaking up and speaking loud and with confidence is very encouraged mm. in, in a lot of, mm. a lot of the Western cultures, especially, but there's those cultures where, you know, s- speaking with confidence in the loudest often gets perceived as having the right, energy to be a good leader or a good manager uh, to to drive forward an organization whereas you know there's a lot of for example like Japanese culture is is very much not overstepping the line in terms of speaking up and speaking out loud and a lot of it comes down to individualistic and collective cultures as well right so in a more individualistic yeah. individualistic culture it is about um, not shouting the loudest but but speaking up because you are putting yourself forward and showing what you are capable of in collective cultures it's almost Mm. like you you know you avoid doing that you're told to everything is kind of the we uh you know us as a family us as an organization and it's not about trying to step ahead of uh anyone to to get to that step ahead and i see how Mm. that closely ties in not always but in a lot of cases with that um power distance obviously the power distance Mm. is how much we give that authority to the leaders above us um so when it came to adapting to that did you see a difference again in kind of the cultures and values you were raised with right where there is that 
um, mm -hmm. certain level of respect given to seniors where you don't talk back to them. When it came to working in, in an organization, um, how did you deal with that dynamic of, you know, speaking up to management or anyone mm -hmm. even of a higher grade than you? Uh, and then did that have an impact on your own career journey and growth? Yeah, I think on reflection, that was much more evident in a school okay. environment yeah. compared to work environment. However, I would say that it was a learning curve for me. So when I started, I definitely felt that I wasn't in, in a place where I could speak up as much as I could because I'm the lowest of the organization. And I think maybe this is a cultural thing or not, um, but I saw hierarchy quite literally yeah. almost. Um, so I think going into an organization that was quite big, you know, you don't feel like you, you could speak up because you're just not at that level yet. You don't have experience yet. But as I grew and I moved up the corporate ladder and I was thinking, okay, you know, now I'm a manager, there are certain things that actually I do have an expertise on and I could speak up about it. And knowing that leaders are receptive to that, I think changed me because knowing that leaders could listen and respond to what you say gives you an opportunity to speak up more. So I think it's really driven by the culture of the organization mm -hmm. and not so much by the culture of people, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, you know, through that journey, what would you say is a really important trait that you can see amongst the successful leaders either of the current mm. generation or the future generation that's going to be um a, you know a consistent character trait in all of them that's going to make them a good leader especially in a multicultural thing yeah i think this made me again reflect on ai and how that's coming in as well because obviously technology replace will replace certain people in the workforce kind of from the ground up and I think this is where leaders would need to really be clued up in terms of how that impact is but also drive the soft skills in terms of empathy listening and be able to coach others as well so having these skills would really enable you to rise above the others and also to put your organization in a less risky position um, and I've seen good leaders do that. Um, and I've seen some of them exhibit it really, really well from my previous workplaces where they've really set the example of taking the lead to, I think ultimately it's about listening to the organization. Um, and I think, especially from, if you're working in a diverse environment, really listening to people with diverse opinions. So not just listening to people who agree with you, but listen to those who have a different voice and taking that into account and working out what collaboratively do we agree on? What do we think the direction is? And I think having that skill to coordinate and collaborate is very, very important um, because we are increasingly mobile as, as, you know, as workplaces and where we are. We have a lot of mobility around the world. We could work globally now, even just on Zoom or whatever technology you want to use. Um, and it's increasingly important that we have this cultural awareness within us and being aware of not just the differences, but also kind of similarities and also having the respect for people ultimately so respecting what they have maybe time off for um respecting their family um respecting stuff that's not just in work but also what's outside of work for them and what's important for them as values as well so the key thing here is not to highlight the differences and be like oh, i'm different from you and i'm not agreeing with you it's really to acknowledge those and really talk about them and not to shy away from them but really talk about and embrace that diversity within the organization. Yeah, it's, it's really well said. And you may have already touched on it, but with the people that you work with now, do you see any trends of what the common sort of mm. issues or difficulties that tend to be faced by these lot? Yeah, so I think we spoke, a bit, spoke about some of them. So some of them is kind of grounded in, if people are migrating to a new country, for example, a lot of it is, you know, language and actually how they maintain um, their image at a workplace. So they feel confident enough to talk in English, for example. Um, there are other challenges such as um, what I did a mini research on some, some time ago around things like bamboo ceiling or actually seeing that within the culture, um, we have got certain virtues like respect and modesty and how that may have the other side um, of maybe thinking that we are not confident enough to speak up. So lack of confidence is always kind of a perception for East Asians. 
And that might have hindered some of us getting promoted or getting a pay, pay rise. Um, it's not always the case, but I think the cultural element is something that people are more aware of as well. So we bring that into the discussion. Um, and there are other aspects around, you know, if people are changing jobs, you know, how would their family perceive them? So the pressure from parents, for example, or if they have family responsibilities, how do they balance that? And I think, you know, a lot of it, you know, is kind of rooted a little bit around the culture. But some of it's also external, you know, kind of from what you've learned throughout your lifetime as well. And given that a lot of people are now more, more mobile, um, it's not just a, you know, a, a unicultural thing or a bicultural thing. Sometimes it's like, OK, we're creating a third culture here. Um, so what does your culture say for you? So I think there are, you know, it, it's not as kind of simple as, you know, knowing that, oh, this is my culture and this is how I'm going to work. This is going to be a question for them to work for themselves because everyone's third culture, everyone's culture is very different. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of what people are facing into and what I saw. Yeah, it's a really important area that you're touching on, I think. And I've, I haven't really spoken to anyone yet that's approaching it from your side. I've had a, a, few, mm. a few guests on who, uh, especially when it comes to raising that intercultural competence from the setting of organizations or from uh, managers mm. who now have a more global team or a more global sort of customer base. But, I, you know, we've yeah. touched on it already, but going to that point of, yes, there is a, a certain level of increasing your competence that that needs to be done. But this, the point around the confidence, um, and I think that's, that can really be built from the person inside because uh, going back to that language example, right? Um, I think mm. there is an, there's an absolute level of capability that you need to have in a certain language. But, you know, in a lot of cases, yeah. cases if you've been employed by an organization um, or you've got into a certain school, you have that absolute level of confidence. But then our perception of our own competence, yeah. I think there's been some studies that have shown that, um, you, you know, where they get asked like how good do you think your language competence is mm -hmm. and in these cases like many self-assessments they often don't actually necessarily reflect the reality a lot of a lot of the mm. same people who um sort of underestimated their language competence it became a really good predictor of their subsequent behavior in the organization so the ones that felt that they weren't good enough at that the main language they also had the same mm -hmm. um, stress and uh, what's called contact avoidance, uh, which is basically that uh, unless they had to, they would avoid making that communication or contact with other colleagues so that they could avoid having to speak the language and make mistakes. So, yeah, I think yeah. what you're doing is is so key because it's increasing that perception that people have of themselves because the skill is already there it's just whether they realize it themselves enough to then go and make um those little steps that could make the big difference essentially yeah yeah for sure and i think this is back to the point where we are you know almost combating our own imposter syndrome mm. um and thinking that you know i'm not good enough even on a language front um most of the time, the real imposters are not really imposters, uh, yeah. you know, suffering from imposter syndrome. Um, so I think, you know, most of the time we do have the ability, we're just not communicating that across or presenting that way. So it's worth rethinking and really taking stock of what we, or we, we already have. And actually this multicultural sense of perception and, you know, what you've experienced in different countries or different geographic locations is very important. And that is a gift in itself. So it's all about embracing that, finding value of that and how then you could contribute to an organization or for yourself as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sumi. It's been, uh, yeah, really, really insightful. And like I touched on <clears throat> there at the end, I think the approach you're taking to that for people who may now be able to relate to the things that you've been through, I think it, it really shows how you are in such a good position to be able to help those that you're helping. Um, so yeah, I love the way they are doing intercultural understanding and cultural intelligence is just something that I personally find super fascinating. And uh, yeah, this is how we connect in the first place. So I'm really excited for what you're going to carry on yeah. doing. Thank you so much, Anna. And it's been a pleasure to be speaking on this podcast. Thanks for having me. And we have a closing tradition on the show, which is mm -hmm. I ask every oh. guest, if you had one message that you could write on a piece of paper that either your own 
family of future generation or the future generation as a whole would open up that piece of paper, read it and try and live by that, what would that say? Mm. Yeah, I would say don't let your past define you. Um, obviously, your past plays a part on your identity, but that is not something that needs to define you. So always seek out what the future looks like for yourself and find your own path. Wow. I love that. Thank you so much. It's uh, honestly been thank you, such a pleasure. I'm sure we'll connect in many ways in the future, but um, thank you and keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you so much, Anand.